you, Lord God. Father, we just thank you, Lord God. We praise you, Father. We thank you for your presence this morning, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for being in our midst, Lord God. Father, we don't take it for granted, Lord God, that you show up, Lord God, every time we come together, Lord God. And so, Father, we just give you honor and glory this morning. Repeat after me. Say, Father, Father in, Jesus name, in Jesus' name, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your, word. I thank you for your, I thank you for your will. And I thank you for your way. Father, anoint the ground of my heart. Father, anoint this word as seed. Father, anoint the sower. Hide her in the gift that you've given to your body so that we will receive a life changing, destiny accelerating revelation of you through your word, by your spirit, and under your anointing. We pray expecting in Jesus' name. Amen. amen and amen give God a great big hand clap of praise amen hallelujah amen yes can I have a little more volume this is the day the Lord has made and I will and you will and we will rejoice and be glad in it amen amen God is a good God amen amen well I'm excited about being here today excited about this series on love because love changes things Amen. Love changes things. When we realize how much God loves us and we can recognize that and internalize that and reflect that, um, and then others get the benefit of the love that God has for you, you realizing the love that God has for you. When others get the benefit of that, we're all the better because of it. Amen. Amen. And so let's just open up our Bibles to 1 Corinthians 13. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. 1 Corinthians 13. This is our scripture on love and uh, such a powerful scripture. It, it is the most complete, I guess you could say, uh, kind of like a definition of love that is in the word of God. And so 1 Corinthians 13, I've been reading it in the voice. Such a powerful scripture. It says, uh, what if I speak in the most elegant languages of people or in the exotic languages of the heavenly messengers, but I live without love? Well, then anything I say is like the clanging of brass or a clashing cymbal. And what if I have the gift of prophecy and I'm blessed with knowledge and insight to all the mysteries? Or what if my faith is strong enough to scoop a mountain from its bedrock, yet I live without love? If so, I'm nothing. I could give all that I have to feed the poor. I could surrender my body to be burned as a martyr. But if I do not live in love, I gain nothing by my selfless acts. For love is patient, love is kind, love isn't envious, doesn't brag, doesn't boast, doesn't strut about, there's no arrogance in love. It's never rude or crude or indecent. It's not self-absorbed. Love isn't easily upset. Love doesn't tally wrongs or celebrate injustice, but truth, yes, truth is love's delight. Love patiently accepts all things, bears all things. It always protects, always trusts, it believes all things, it always hopes. It hopes all things, it always endures. It endures all things. Love will never become obsolete. And in your Bible it probably says love will what? It will never fail. Now as for the prophetic gifts, they will not last. Unknown languages will become silent, and the gift of knowledge will no longer be needed. Gifts of knowledge and prophecy are partial at best, at least for now. But when the perfection and fullness of God's kingdom arrive, all the parts will end. When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned in childlike ways, as we all do. But when I became a man or a woman, I left my childish ways behind. For now we can only see a dim and blurry picture of things, as when we stare into polished metal. I realize that everything I know is only part of the big picture, but one day when Jesus arrives, we will see clearly face to face. And in that day, I will fully know, just as I have been wholly known by God. But now faith, hope, and love remain. These three virtues must characterize our lives, and the greatest of these is what? Is love. Amen. And so uh, last week, I feel like I've been gone forever. A lot has happened in this last week. I feel like I've been gone for two weeks. Amen. How many of you had a busy week this week? Amen. I feel like I've been, yeah, praise God. Well, I'm going to give a review anyway. Amen. And so we had an awesome time. We came together, west meets east. Amen. And, uh, and so when we came together, it was an awesome time in the Lord. And I gave a review for the last time. I'm going to give a review for what we did last week, okay? So last week we talked about the, the title of this series, for those of you who have not uh, maybe been here for the first couple weeks, is Love Ability. Somebody say Love Ability. And it's the ability that God has given you to love. The, the necessity of you understanding this is so great. I'm going to tell you why here in a minute. We begin to talk about um, fine-tuning our love frequency in the first 
lovability. Then the second one, we talked about a lifestyle of love uh, in our second one. And then today we're going to talk about something different. But in the lifestyle of love, we said there were three things that we needed to do. We needed to realize that, that we uh, and internalize the love of Christ. We needed to receive the love of Christ. And then we needed to reflect the love of Christ. And so um, here it is. God's love for the world and for us, we said, was the greatest show on earth. We said it's not about that movie, The Greatest Show on Earth. We said that, that God's demonstration of his love for us was the greatest show on earth. God is very clear. John 3, 16, he says, like, what, for God so what? He loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that who should so ever believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's the ultimate act or demonstration of love. Then we saw it in Jesus in his demonstration. The fact that the Bible says that he obeyed the Lord even unto death. He obeyed, obeyed God even unto his death. He obeyed God. And so we saw that there was a, uh, they, that there was a, uh, that there was a, uh, uh, what do I want to say? I want to say uh, not a correlation because it was a direct re response uh, from love, from obedience to love. When you obey, obey God, then you show that you love him. When you obey God, you show that you love him. He says, you love me, you keep my commandments. So we saw that Jesus obeyed his father. He went all the way to the cross and he obeyed him even unto his death. That is how he showed his love for his father. And so then we saw that the Holy Spirit also shows his love for us. He's all our comforter. He's our helper. He's our guide. He's our intercessor. He's our counselor. He's all those things. But he also is one who pours out love for us. The Bible in Romans 5 and 5 says the Holy Spirit pours God's love out into our hearts. That's how we know. That's how we have an understanding that he loves us. Because the Holy Spirit's job is to take the love and to pour it into your heart. Now, we said that love is not a feeling. We said that, you know, love is not locked up in a fickle feeling. That love is, is an action word. It's something that is to be demonstrated. It is a strategic plan of God to show forth the care and the concern, the compassion that he has for us. We also learned that love there is agape. And all of the context that we've been using love and that we will continue to use love, we're using it in the context of what the word agape is. And we said agape was to prefer, it is to elevate, and it is to promote. And so when we love, we elevate others, we promote others, and we prefer others. When we love, we agape God, we prefer God, we elevate him, we magnify his name, and we promote him. Amen? And so we said that love is not locked up in a feeling. We looked at the scripture in 1 Corinthians 13, and when we looked down a little further, we kind of saw the fact that God talked about all that love is. And then he said, when I was a child, I thought as a child, and I spoke as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. So last week, one of the things we learned is that it's a childish way to think that love is reduced to a feeling. That's the way a child thinks, that it's a feeling. You've got to feel all warm and cozy inside. When love has nothing to do with a feeling, it has all to do with an act all to do with a demonstration. And so he says, look, when I became a man, I put away childish things. Now I'm not thinking like a child anymore. I'm not expecting words of love to produce. I'm expecting actions of love to produce. And so it's very, very important because, you know, we can say we love somebody all day long, but if we don't do something to show it, then it means nothing. And so love is superior. The Bible says love is superior. If you look at the end of 1 Corinthians 13, it was very clear. He said, look, Faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of all of these is love. That's pretty powerful when he says the just can't, you know, the just only live by what? By faith. He said the just live by faith. He said without, without faith, it's impossible to please God. He said you think about faith and you think about hope, and love is better than that. You mean to tell me that I can't even please God if I don't have faith, and love is better than that? He said love is better than that. It's more superior than that. And we've got to get a different attitude. We've got to, we've got to get a, a mindset, an adult mindset, a grown mindset, a growth mindset that says that love is not a feeling. We've got to step away from that paradigm. Love is all about an action. And so God says, look, love is superior. Love never fails. Not in the past, not in the future. Love will never, ever fail. It will never lose its potency. Never grow weak. Never lose its potency. Why is that important? It's important because when the enemy comes to tell you that you can't love somebody, that you can't demonstrate love for someone who did something, who said something, who behaved a certain way, when the enemy tells you you can't do that, you can honestly tell him that th that is the lie from the pit of hell. That is, does not line up with the word of God because God said that I can love. He said that I can love because he first loved me. And so it's important for us to understand that love never, ever fails, never loses its potency. We also said, and we're still in review, that Jesus' love, the agape, again, was an act of preference, promotion, and preparation. 
We said Jesus preferred. When we think about the woman, uh, the, the woman who didn't deserve to be preferred. They thought, I thought about Mary, the fact that she was there and she was in the presence of uh, some of the other disciples. And she broke that alabaster box and began to you know, wipe Jesus' feet with her hair and with that precious oil that she had saved up that was expensive. And others thought, you know, what is, what is this woman doing in the presence of the Lord? You know, giving of herself this way, giving uh, of herself that way. Well, Jesus preferred and said, no, leave her alone. Basically, close your mouth, leave her alone. Let her do what she needs to do because this is her demonstration of love toward me and my preference toward her and love toward her is I'm going to prevent others from getting on her case. I'm going to prevent others from being, you know, preventing her from loving me. And so we think about the fact that Jesus, is, his love was an act of preference. It was an act of promotion. He was, he was a, a, an awesome, um, it's an awesome example. I think about the fact that there's so many examples, but he says the first shall be last and the last shall be first. He said, look, I need you to understand something. Um, just because you came into the harvest uh, last doesn't mean you're any less than the person who came into the harvest first. When we look at the parable and we understand the parable of those who came into the, uh, into the workplace, the, hire, the, the hirelings that came in, you know, Jesus said, look, uh, well, it's Jesus, it's the parable, but the man said, look, hey, look, I'm going to hire these guys, I'm going to hire these guys, I'm going to hire these guys. They all came into the field at different times, but I'm going to pay them whether they came first or whether they came last. You don't need to worry about it. You don't need to get upset about it. I love them. I prefer them. I'm promoting them, and I have a right to do so. When we think about the love of God, the love of God is individual. It's corporate, but it's individual. It's very, very individual, and we've got to embrace it individually. Somebody say individually. So Jesus' love was an act of preference, of promotion, and then preparation. We talked about the fact that Jesus spent time with the disciples. He spent time. His love, his showing of love toward them was the fact that he spent time with them. He didn't spend a little bit of time with them. He spent a lot of time with them. And we talked about the time that we need to spend uh, taking care of ourselves. How many of you are going to uh, implement some self-care, some, some time? You get, that, you get that Sabbath down we talked about last week, determining what day, what day of the week is your Sabbath so that you can show that you love God by taking care of yourself. Yeah, you show that you love God by caring for yourself. You show that you love God. Now, we got to all do better than this, right? By what we put in our mouths. Amen. We show we love God by what we put in our mouths. Yeah, because the Bible says we don't own ourselves. Our bodies are not our own. And so we show God how much we love him by taking it seriously as to what we go. What goes. Now, I'm not saying being legalistic and, and being in bondage and going in bondage about what you eat. That kind of thing. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, if you look at yourself and say, I've been bought with a price. What Jesus did on the cross was not an accident. It was specifically for me. And because I've been bought with a price, I'm going to make sure I'm not doing this to look good. I'm not doing this to get attention. I'm doing this because I am a good steward over what God has given me, which is me. Right? You're a good steward over what God has given you, which is you. You only get one body. You only get what well, we're, we're Christians. We're not, you know, Buddhists, and we don't right. really, we don't come back as another life, right. right? We have one body, one body. So whatever you did to it before, that's been covered and washed by the blood of Jesus. You got a new body, you're a new creation, a new being. You could, yes, I hear somebody saying, but I did this, I did drugs, I did this, I did that. It doesn't matter what you've done. It's been washed in the blood. It's been washed in the blood. Do you understand that you could, you are a, it's for real, you are a new creation created in Christ Jesus. So that means whatever you did before, do you understand that God can renew and restore like it never ever happened? Right? He, he can renew and restore your mind like you never smoked that weed every other day. He can literally renew and restore, like the world says brain cells can't be restored, but the Lord God says that he's a God of restoration. He's, he's a God, a, a healing God. He can make you as swift as you've never been before. He can cause you to, he can cause wherever there was a flaw to be, for literally in that area of your brain or your mind to be flawless. There are people who are born on this planet, who are born into this earth with parents who have generations and generations and generations of drug use and drug abuse. And so they may not have come out the way maybe you think they should have come out. But do you know that God is such a restoring God and a healing God? And what he did at the cross was more than enough, more than sufficient to go back to go back and go through generations and generations and generations of people who made a decision to accept him as their Lord and Savior and from that moment forward, change. From that moment forward, change and affect change in the minds of people. Don't ever let anybody tell you that you can't change mentally. 
Don't ever let anybody tell you you can't change emotionally. Don't ever let anybody tell you that you're at the you're at the height of where you can be or you can't accomplish much more. Don't ever let a family member tell you that you've already capped your potential. Because it's not true. What, what Christ did on the cross, what God did on the cross with putting his son there, allowing his son to go there, he did it for you, and he did it so you could be made brand new. Now we look and we say, no, no, my hands don't look new, my feet don't look new, you know, I still have wrinkles here and there, I still got stretch marks here and there. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about in the mind. The Bible says that the spirit of a man is what sustains him, not, the, not my body. This doesn't sustain me. My spirit man sustains me. The Bible says that the breath of the Almighty gives me life. What gives me life each and every day is the breath of God. It's the spirit of God on the inside of me. And so you have to know and understand that the love of God is so strong. I feel like somebody needs to hear this this morning. That no matter what happens, it doesn't matter what's on your bloodline. It doesn't matter how many times they, de they determined that they were going to deny God and live a crazy life. You didn't. You didn't. You may have, but you didn't now. You don't now. And so at this point in time, you need to see yourself the way God sees you. He's not looking at you looking down on your bloodline, looking at all the wrong things that everyone has done. He's looking at the right decision that you have made. He's looking at the right decision that you have made, and if you will be bold enough to ask him to do some things, he will do them. If you'll be bold enough to ask him to do some things, he will do them. Anybody have issues when they were in school where they just, just didn't catch on to things as quickly as other people? Right? You know, maybe, you know, in math, everybody was doing their times tables and you couldn't get yours. That was me. I was like, I kept trying to memorize them. It's like, dang, people were just going through them. And I'm like in the second, third grade, whatever it was when you're doing your times tables. And I'm like, man, I just, I can't, I just, anything else I can memorize. But that math, I was just like, it was like a whole other foreign language for me. And I was good with foreign languages. Actually, I started foreign languages in second, third grade. But something about math, I'm like, why my brain, it just can't click. It just doesn't click on math like that. You know, everybody's understanding. I'm, I'm acting like I understand, but I don't, I don't understand what they're talking about. So I was in honors everything except math. I was in regular math. And so I'm like, I just, I don't get it. I don't understand it. I, it, it I mean, I would come away like, I just, I don't understand why I don't understand. It just didn't make sense. You know what I'm saying? And so I went back and I remember thinking, I'm not dumb. I, I know I'm not dumb. And I, I know, I, you know, I know I can understand what she's saying, but the concepts just aren't like, clicking in my mind. And it wasn't until, I mean, I did well in math. I did okay. I mean, I got like B's or whatever, but it wasn't like I, I, I really got it. Like I, it was the Lord, right? And so when I got in college, I had this professor and he called himself a genius. His name was Pedro Oliver. He was from Cuba. He was real little. And he used to walk around talking about how much of a genius he was and how smart he was. And I remember saying to Dr. Oliver, okay, look, Dr. Oliver, I never really cared about math that much and I don't really need it. You know, I'm a journalism major. You know, my thing is writing and languages and words. And, and so he's like, no, he said, I'm a genius. I can help you understand that. And so what he did was he related math to English for me. He related math to literature for me. And he related math to things that I can understand and then I can understand the concepts and the numbers. So now, now you know, in college, I'm like A's and trig and A's and calculus and A's and, you know, all this stuff. And I'm trying to understand what happened between then and there. And, you know, like what happened between the second and third grade? How did I all of a sudden understand math? I mean, in its fullness. How did I understand it once I got to college? And I began to ask the Lord. I'm just being honest and forthright with you. And I know, I know my father wouldn't mind if I shared this with him. Somebody needs this, right? And so, uh, and I started to think and I thought to myself, well, you know, I have been praying. I've been asking the Lord to open up the eyes of my understanding. I asked the Lord to, you know, they say in the world that your brain only uses 10% of its capacity. Some people say 15%. So I've been asking the Lord, Lord, help me use more of my brain. I'm like, maybe if I can access more of my brain, I can, I can memorize it more. I can, I can, like, get more information in there and it would stay. And so I've been praying that. And then the Lord brought to my attention, I, literally. And I thought, well, maybe I, it wasn't clicking because my dad smoked recreational weed. Maybe it wasn't clicking because, maybe because even though he was, he wasn't a bum and he, all his friends were judges, he was all in the political world and these judges and lawyers, but yeah, on their recreational time, that's what some of them did. I grew up in New Orleans in the 70s. That's just, that's how, what was going on back then. And even though my mother didn't do that stuff, my, I told y'all my father didn't get saved until I was 17, 16, 17. So his friends were all, you know, I lived in a very bohemian time back then, all right? And so, um, so I remember thinking, I thought, well, maybe from him smoking so much weed, maybe that, like, caused me not to be able to make the connection. Y'all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> don't act like y'all don't know what I'm talking about. 
maybe that caused me to not be able to make some of the mathematical connections, not serious, um, some of the mathematical connections. So I began to pray. And I was like, Lord, whatever they did, let it not affect me. Whatever, whatever they did, whatever choices they made, let it not affect me because, you know, I didn't have anything to do with that. So help me to understand what I need to understand so that I can move forward and don't penalize me because the Bible says that God visits down for thousands of generations on those who either do good or don't do or don't line up with them, right? So I'm like, Lord, you know what? I made the decision to be, you know, your daughter. And so I'm asking you to reverse some stuff. Reverse some stuff. Reverse some stuff. Some of y'all need some stuff reversed. Some of y'all need some. And, and the, the good thing about DWC is that we're a church that we believe in love, liberation, and leading. Part of the liberation today is you're going to get free from some things. I believe God. You're going to get free from some things that you had nothing to do with. That you had nothing to do with. You didn't sign up for it. You didn't ask for it. You didn't, you know, you didn't get in line for it. You didn't even know about it. All you know is you're having some difficulties in some areas of your life you don't realize why and it could be that it has nothing to do with what you've done but God is a good God so I say good God and he loves you so much that he will undo some things you know there's everybody in our lives in our bloodline didn't always make the perfect decision nobody comes from a perfect bloodline nobody comes from a perfect bloodline but Jesus and his bloodline wasn't perfect he was perfect but his bloodline wasn't perfect and so we have to know and understand God loved us so much that he even provided the example of Jesus so that we can know and understand that we didn't have to come here perfect or there would need no, be no need for the blood sacrifice. There would be no need for him to come. So we've got to know and understand. Stop being down on yourself. I'm ahead of myself because I was going to talk about self-love, but I'm just into it right now. Stop being down on yourself because of mistakes that you've made. Stop being down on yourself because of things that you've done. Allow the love of God to cover Allow the, blood, the love of God to wash. Allow the love of God to help you to know and understand that who you are now is not who you were before. Not who you were before. You were the, the person that you were before is not who you are now. And so you can't look down on yourself. You can't even look back and say, dang, I went through this divorce and that divorce and had this abortion and that abortion and I, and I murdered this person and I, and, I killed, and I did this and I did that. You can't look down on, who, on what you did before because you're not that same person now. So it, isn't that kind of ludicrous to look back as you're a different person now at the person you were before? You're no longer that person. The more that you understand that God loves you, the more that you embrace the fact that God cares for you, the more that you can wrap your mind around the fact that it's not about a feeling, it's about what he did for you, you can begin to forgive yourself for things that you have done. So important. So important. So important. So important. Well, I'm past, I, I can't even get into the, the rest of the, uh, I, I, I passed the review. I'm going to have to ignore the review because I'm already in my lesson. My lesson today is responsibility of love, and I'm already into it, so I have to give you, a, you know, you have to watch last week. No review. The Holy Spirit is doing what he wants to do. Amen. This week, love ability part three, responsibility of love, responsibility of love. We have a responsibility. Last week we talked about the demonstration. Now we talked about our responsibility to love, our responsibility of love. God's love, we said, is a strategic action, not a fickle feeling. We did say it's the greatest show of earth. Show is an acronym. Uh, we need to show our love, demonstrate our love on uh, the love that we have for God, the love we have toward other people on a regular basis. The acronym SHOW, S-H-O-W, is S, submit. We have to submit to God's love strategy. He has a strategy for love. He says a very simple, it's a very simple strategy. You love because I loved. That's the strategy. <laughs> you can love because I love. Because I love you, now you have the innate ability inside of you. You accepted them as your Lord and Savior. You have the ability on the inside of you to love. Two, this is the H. Humble yourself. You have to humble yourself. One of the issues, one of the problems, one of the situations that occurs oftentimes with believers is that they don't humble themselves. They don't humble themselves to the degree that they can know and understand that God loves them. See, if we're out here thinking that, hey, 
you know what, we can be our own man, be our own woman, do our own thing. Um, you know, we've got all this education, we have all this experience, we have all these friends, we have all these followers, we have all the, then, then there's no need for us to believe that God loves us because we think that it's enough for people to love us. It's not always about the horizontal, it's more about the vertical. When we have the relationship with God that God desires for us to have such that we obey him, because remember obedience is tied to love, such that we obey him and we walk in his precepts and we, we get that love that's going up and down, now we can from the overflow have love that's here from one to another. It's not a, it's not a situation um, where God says, look, okay, you've already loved, you've loved one, you've loved another, okay, you're done with love, you're all finished with love now, you, you've demonstrated, no, he's says consistently we've got to be on this love walk uh, I'm already to my W got to get to my O first obey so we got to submit to God's love strategy humble yourself obey his word I said that I said it again obedience and love are tied together if you love me you what keep my commandments if you love me you'll keep my commandments if you love me you'll obey me that's how we demonstrate our love toward God we keep his commandments last week I talked about the principle we keep the principles we live our lives by precept and by principle and then the last one is W, walk in love. So walk in love. We determine that, um, that God's desire says in Ephesians 5 and 2, and walk continually in love. That is, value one another, practice empathy and compassion, unselfishly seeking the best for others, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, and offering and sacrifice to God slain for you so that it became a sweet fragrance. He says, look, I need you to continually walk in love. Like, don't stop keep walking in love. So S-H-O-W, we've got to first submit to God's love strategy. We've got to humble. Uh, and our, his love strategy was to realize, reflect, and receive. Realize his love, internalizing what he's did, done. Receive his love, accept what Jesus did, and reflect his love, demonstrate it out of the overflow uh, of his love toward us. We demonstrate it toward others. Humble. We don't try to, uh, we, we don't try to um, feelize love and, and cause it to be like just an emotion. But, uh, but we determined that we're going to understand that it's a part of the strategy that God has to bless us and then obey. We love God and we love others because the Bible says it's a commandment. He says, look, if this is a commandment, and, uh, and not only is it a commandment, it's one of, of the best commandments, he says. And we're going to look at that scripture in a minute. And then W, we're going to walk in love, his strategy and plan for us to love other people. Now, responsibility of love, responsibility of love, increasing our love walk. Um, to walk continually in love, like he says in Ephesians 5 and 2. Continually. Could somebody say continually? That means we don't stop. That means we do not stop. That means no matter what happens, no matter what take place, takes place, we do not stop walking in love. Number one, we've got to embrace love. Somebody say embrace love. Number two, we have to, we have to understand that God's love is enduring. So say enduring love. Number three, say evolving love. Number four, say evasive love. And then number five, say entrusted love. All right, number one, embracing love. We have to embrace love. Embracing love. Now remember, I'm going to use the word love interchangeably with what agape means, which is promotion, preference, and elevation. So embracing love is embracing the promotion, the preference, and the elevation of God's self and others in your life. Three, three ways. Embracing the promotion, preference, and elevation of God, of self, and others your life. So the first one, loving God, embracing love. Um, God says, look, I need you to know something. I need you to understand something. I don't want you to be religious when it comes to loving me. I don't want you to be religious when it comes to loving me. Um, disregarding what agape is um, and choosing to obey what's just easy and simple to obey. Look at Luke 11.42 or at least write down Luke 11.42. It says, but whoa, judgment is coming to you Pharisees because you, you self-righteously tithe mint and rue and every little garden herb tending to all the minutiae, and yet disregard and neglect justice and the love of God. But these are things you should have done without neglecting the others. He said, look, I need you to understand something. These Pharisees, these Sadducees, these, these religious folks, you know, they had a, a level of belief, but they didn't fully believe a, that, a word that lined up with the word. They believed parts, pieces of the word. He says, look, I need to tell you something. You religious people, you know, you tithe, and you tithe mint, and you tithe every little garden herb. You even get down to every little nitty-gritty detail. He said, but one thing I realized is that you disregard and you neglect love. So he said, look, I don't care how much money you give. I don't care how much tithing you give. I don't care how much offering you give. He says, look, 
these are things you should have done. You should have, in the process of doing those things that are required of you, doing those things that show forth love, you should have loved some other people. You should have loved some people. Because one of the issues with the Pharisees and the Sadducees is that they weren't loving toward other people, right? They had issues with other people. They had issues with people that weren't like them. They had issues with people that were a little bit different than them. And they had problems wherever they went because they really thought that they were above other people. You know, the Bible is very clear. It says, look, I need you to know and understand, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to. No, they were those who thought more highly of themselves than they ought to. They went out, the Bible says, in the, in, the, in the streets and in the corners, and they prayed in front of people, and they wanted to be thought of as important. They were very religious people. And he said, okay, I appreciate the fact that you're giving your tithes. I appreciate the fact that you're giving your offering. You even pay, you even pay attention to the very details of the little herbs that you give me, but you can't even love. You can't even love. And he's like, look, I need you to understand something. You should have done those things, but she should have they never neglected the other things. You should have never, ever neglected the other things. So we need to know and understand that in showing and demonstrating our love for God, we cannot be religious in doing so. We can't be so caught up in doing other things like making sure we got our ties, making sure we got our envelope. What about the person that you were supposed to have shown love to yesterday? What about the person you were supposed to have shown love to last week? What about that family member who's addicted to an opiate drug that you get tired of them calling you on the phone you don't want to have anything to do with them? This is a real story for me. You don't want to have anything to do with them. You don't want to have anything to do with them because you remember when they were not addicted. And now they're addicted, you don't want to have anything to do with them. Where's the love in that? Where's the love in that? The, the love still needs to be shown, shown and demonstrated, even if it's 1,500 miles away. And it's just a phone call so that they can hear somebody on the other line who has the presence and spirit of God. Because the Bible says that the spirit doesn't know any, any distance. So what if me answering, answering that relative's call to make sure that they are okay or just to check on them is a demonstration of a love and a compassion that not only that I have for them, but it also is me being representative of Jesus Christ as an ambassador. I'm going to them and I'm calling them as an ambassador saying, you know what, I appreciate you, I love you, I know you can't have, understand what I'm saying, but I want you to know that God loves you and I believe in God that you will be free from this stuff. That's... That is just as important as you coming and giving your tithes and offerings every week. Just as important. Just as important. And so we've got to know and understand. We can't be religious about this thing. I got my stuff together. I'm like, what about the calls you need to make? What about the people you need to visit? What about the things you need to do to demonstrate your love? Amen? We can't get it, we, we can't get it twisted in the sense that God's love is demonstrated and, and not respond to change. We've got to respond to change. Revelations 3 and 19. Revelations 3 and 19 says those. This. Those whom I dearly and tenderly love, I rebuke and discipline, showing them their faults and instructing them. So be enthusiastic. Now, wait a minute. Those don't seem like they go together. Wait, right? Because usually when you get rebuked and disciplined, you, you're not enthusiastic. Right? I'm not I'm like, yes. You know, you don't get all excited because you've just been rebuked. Right? But he says, no, I need you to understand something. God says, those whom I dearly love and tenderly love, I rebuke and discipline, showing them their faults and instructing them. He doesn't just say where you're wrong. He shows you where you need to be right. So be enthusiastic and repent. Change your inner self, your old way of thinking, your sinful behavior, and seek God's will. So this is, this is what I'm saying here. Um, we don't need to get it twisted. God's love is demonstrated, and we have to respond with change. His love is demonstrated in a way that maybe we don't demonstrate our love. Maybe we grew up in a household or a home. Remember, God is not a God, uh, uh, you know, a man that he should lie. He doesn't respond like we, we respond to things. So maybe we grew up in a home where, you know, your parents played the silent treatment. You did something wrong. They didn't talk to you. They neglected you or they abandoned you or they walked away or they didn't feel like they had anything to say to you because you disappointed them or you let them down. Or maybe you grew up in a home where, you know, you were in a situation where uh, a rebuke was not just a rebuke. It was much more stern than that, and it caused you a lot of hurt and a lot of pain because you didn't have an instruction to go along with it. Because the Bible is very clear about how children are to be raised. He says the rod and correction. Yes. He says discipline and instruction. Yes. And so it's not just you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. It's like this is wrong, let me show you how you have to do it right. right. It's like this is wrong, let me show you the right way. But we get a lot of this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. We never learn the right way. Then anger and resentment and frustration and bitterness throws. So that's why we have to make sure that in generations to come that we don't parent, grandparent, great-grandparent our children in a way that continues that cycle of not giving instruction, right? 
And so we have to know and understand that God's love is demonstrated in the rebuke and the instruction, but it's for the purposes of us being, at, being enthusiastic to repent and change our ways. And so when we get God's love, God's love is going to come. Now, the Holy Spirit speaks to other people besides us, right? He speaks to people around us. So if your employer says to you that you need to change your countenance, because every time you come in, you look like you're frowning up, you got that resting crazy look, you know, and you need to change that, then you need to not be upset. Maybe God is speaking to them. But we don't like the package that came in. God is still speaking. But we don't like the package that came in. And we determine they, they don't like me anyway. So I'm not going to change. We just disregarded the fact that God loves us so much that he wants us to change. And he wants us to get some things right. So let's begin to listen for God in ways that maybe we didn't think he was going to come. Remember, in the Bible, it was very, very clear. Jesus said, look, they think I'm coming this way. I'm coming another way. So I'm not going to close my ears out. I'm going to listen to what will improve me. I'm going to listen to what will make me better. I'm going to listen to what will cause me, you know, to have a, to be, to have a very beneficial um, and, and an asset-based kind of you know, relationship. You want to have a relationship with somebody where you're an asset, they're an asset, you're not a liability, they're not a liability. It's mutually beneficial for everybody, right? And so, yeah, the boss, you may think they're not mutually beneficial for you, but you need to open up your ears. That friend that tells you you're mean, you're just mean. You're just mean. You need to go back and reflect. Am I mean? Am I being mean? Would that, ask the question. Don't get upset and just jump to your feelings. Don't just jump into your feelings right away. Okay, what? You know, ask the question. I always tell my kids, ask the question. Well, well what did I do that caused you to feel that way or think that way or make that response to me? And they may give you some very enlightening revelations. And then you may go back and say, wow, you know, that is really nice. Maybe I need to, you know, rearrange this. Or maybe I need to say this a little differently or do that a little differently. Know that God is going to constantly, he says it very clearly. He said, because he tenderly and dearly loves you. Tenderly and dearly loves you. He's going to rebuke and he's going to discipline. And you've got to be willing to repent, to be enthusiastic about repenting. Like, okay, you need me to change that? All right, let me go back. Let me pray. Let me share with God. All right, you have this, God. I'm going to make, make a change on that. I'm going to make some changes. Amen? Y'all got it? That's loving God. That's embracing the love. Loving God. Loving yourself. Somebody say, be humble. You got to be humble. Real, real simple. Be teachable. Be me. It says in Micah 6 and 8. Micah 6 and 8. He has told you, O oh man, what is good. What does the Lord require of you except to be just and to love, to diligently practice kindness and compassion, and to walk humbly with your God, setting aside any, any, aside any overblown sense of importance or self-righteousness. He says, no, no, I need you to understand something. Now, now, people can sometimes have an overblown sense of themselves. They think they're a 10 and they're a 2. You know what I'm saying? They, they can think they're a 10 and they're a 2. They can, they can talk themselves up to being, you know, a, a 100 on, a, you know, on the scale of 100. And, you know, God is saying you're 50. You've got, you got a ways to go. You know, and so you need to know and understand. Don't get a, an overinflated view of yourself. He said, look, I need you to know, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to, because see, usually you got to get smacked back down. When you start thinking highly of yourself, you got to get smacked back down so you don't think highly of yourself anymore. And it's very important because you don't need God to smack you back down, right? You might as well just humble yourself. Go in and get down yourself, right? Go in and get down yourself. You don't need him to do that for you, right? You'll need him to make you humble. You'll need him to make you submit. Go ahead and just submit so he'll have to make you submit, right? Go ahead and be humble so he'll have to make you humble. How many people have you seen in, that are celebrities, that are movie stars, that are actors, actresses, you know, where they just inflate themselves and they got to be smacked down by a situation, right? And, and the next thing you know, you know, they're all, you know, kind of meek and, you know, they're a little bit different, a little demeanor, you know, they're not all big and brash and tough and rough on the edges. They got a little smacked down a little, well, I was going to say somebody's name, Lord, it's on video, so I won't. But there's a famous comedian, and um, he's, yes, <laughs> there's a famous comedian who just, you know, big and brash, and, you know, all of a sudden, and after a while, that mouth gets him in trouble, you know, and then, you know, you got to smack yourself down, now you're talking about God, you're talking about the Lord, come on, just do that first, and you don't have to go that route, right, you don't have to go that route, you don't have to go that route, amen, so somebody say, be humble, that's how you love yourself. You love yourself. Because the Bible says, you know, we can't love others unless we can lo first love ourselves, right? We got to love ourselves first. We just don't have to like, um, we don't have to be enamored with ourselves, right? We can love ourselves. We don't have to be enamored. Amen. 
Amen. Because we got to, from that love, we can love other people. So that's loving ourselves, properly esteeming and value ourselves. Romans 12 and 3, it says, For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think. He said, but think soberly. I think that's kind of funny. He said, because you're drunk. You're thinking that, you're thinking, you're thinking you're all this and this and this. You're, you, you're drunk. So you're on, like Bishop, you say, you're on drugs, right? <laughs> he said, look, I need you to understand, look. But to think soberly, according as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. Because some people believe, well, you know, they got all this faith. You know, I'm the big faith man, the big faith woman. I got all this faith. I can look at my life. Look at what I've done. Look at what God has done. According to my faith being unto me, I'm big now. I got this. I got that. I got this. I got that. And, and truth be told, the Bible says the greatest of all is love. So I appreciate, appreciate the fact that all your faith produced all that. And I appreciate the fact that you're walking by faith. It's all a good thing. It's all necessary. But love is better than all that. Love is better than all that. Amen? And so there are three freedoms I have to loving yourself. Just to make it easy, just so you can remember. Three freedoms to loving yourself. And I just made an acronym, and it says HUB. And just give yourself a big hug. H-U-G. HUB. HUB. H. Hustle. Somebody say hustle. Number two, uh, uh, U is unleash. And three is glorify. So hustle, number one, don't waste your time with your old mentality. Um, recognize that you're at a different place in your life now than you were before. That's what we said earlier. Hustle, don't waste your time being stagnant with the same old mentality that you had before. Move forward, get it together. Hustle, go, move, understand that God loves you. You don't have to be stuck in the same paradigms and mindsets. You don't have to view yourself the way you viewed yourself before. You don't even have to listen to the people who say that you're the same person that you were before. You can look at yourself the way God looks at you, understanding and knowing that was all washed by the blood of Jesus. You're not the same person. You are not the sum total of every mistake you've ever made. You are not. And so you've got to hustle forward in your thinking. You've got to unleash. You've got to detach yourself from the event or the situation. Detach yourself from the event or situation. Yes, you've been divorced three times. Yes, you've had 20 abortions. Yes, you've murdered somebody. You killed somebody. Yes, you used to dance on poles. Yes, you... Uh-uh. He says, look, I need you to know something. In order to, in order to understand the love of God and what he's done for you and to love yourself properly, you've got to hustle past this mindset, okay? You've got to unleash the way that you have viewed yourself and detach yourself from those events and those situations. The blood of Jesus can wash, the Bible says, your consciousness from that stuff. That means the thoughts that you had when you were doing that stuff, he can wash them away. Even when the enemy tries to bring pictures back up, even when the enemy tries to bring memories back up, he can wash that. Maybe you never asked him to wash it away before. Maybe you never asked him to rid your mind of those memories, of those things. Maybe you never asked him, I, my, my prayer used to always say, Lord, obliterate those things from my mind, that they're not even thoughts anymore, that I don't even think this, or I don't even see this, or I don't even smell or imagine. or Just, Lord, let it be gone to the degree that it never, ever happened. Unleash. Number three, and then glorify God. Show gratitude to God. Give praise for what he's done. Thank him in advance, even while you're believing God for the full manifestation of it to happen, to come to pass in your life. Thank him now. Give him glory now. Somebody say hug. Hug yourself. Give you a great big, give yourself a great big hug. Because it's so very important to know and understand, to move forward in the things of God, realizing the love that he has for you, you have to love yourself first. And you have to love other people. Love others requires you to, uh, loving others requires you to monitor, monitor and watch your own behavior. When you love other people, you monitor your own behavior, right? How do you monitor your own behavior? Well, someone says something, someone does something, you could do something else, right? <laughs> you could say something else. You could respond another way. Loving other people requires you to monitor your own behavior. Galatians 5.13 says this, For you, my brothers, were called to freedom. Only do not let your freedom become an opportunity for the sinful nature the worldliness or the selfishness, but through love, serve and seek the best for one another. So look now, look, you have a liberty, you have a freedom. You, there's some things that you can do. You know the scripture that says, you know, everything is what is, is not, is lawful, but it may not be proper. So he said, look, I need you to understand something. There's some things that you have some freedom to do. Yes, you can do these things. You're not going to be put in jail if you do this. No, you're not going to be, you know, called into uh, accountability. Uh, publicly if you don't if you do this but I got to let you know that that everything is not profitable everything is not profitable and when I'm showing forth love to other people I need to take other people into consideration when I'm saying or doing what I'm saying or doing and so I thought about uh, the, the significance um, of that and I'm going to tell you a story in just a moment and loving 
others, loving others, and watching our own behavior. But I want to go on to the second one, because this was actually embracing love. The second one is enduring love. Say enduring love. Enduring love is preferring, elevating, and promoting compassion through and in the midst of. I'll tell you what that is. Many of you are familiar. I think everybody's familiar with the prodigal son. If you go into Luke 15, Luke 15, 11 through 32, we know about the prodigal son. Prodigal son. This man had two sons, all right? And uh, these two sons that he had, we know one was younger, one was older, and the younger one determined that um, he wanted his share of property that belonged to him. Let's look at this account very quickly. He says, then he said a certain man had two sons. The younger of them inappropriately said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that falls to me. So he divided the estate between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered together everything that he had and traveled to a distant country, and there he wasted his fortune in reckless and immoral living. Now when he had spent everything, a, se a severe famine occurred in that country, and he began to do without and be in need. So he went and forced himself on one of the citizens of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He would have gladly eaten the carob pods that the pigs were eating, but they would not satisfy or could not satisfy his hunger. And no one was giving anything to him. But when he finally came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough food while I'm out here dying of hunger? I'll get up and go to my father, and I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Just treat me like one of your hired men. So he got up and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, and he was moved with compassion for him. And he ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quickly, bring out the best robe for the guest of honor and put it on him. And give him a ring for his hand and sandals for his feet. And bring the fatted calf and slaughter it. And let us invite everyone and feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was as good as dead and is alive again. He was lost and has been found. So they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field. And when he returned and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. And he summoned one of the servants and began asking them what the celebration meant. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But the elder brother became angry and deeply resentful and was not willing to go in. And his father came out and began pleading with him. But he said to his father, look, these many years I have served you and have never neglected or disobeyed your command. Yet you have never given me so much as a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when his other son of yours arrived, who devoured your estate with immoral women, you slaughtered that fatted calf for him. And the father said to him, son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But it was fitting to celebrate and rejoice, for this brother of yours was as good as dead and has begun uh, uh, to live. He was lost and has been found. This is the enduring love of Christ. The enduring love says, look, you might have been out there, you might have been in the hog pen, you might have been doing some crazy, wild stuff. He said, but I need you to know and understand something, that those who have been in that situation... God welcomes you just as much as he welcomes the one who's been living, you know, to others that holy and sanctified and set apart life all along. We can't distinguish ourselves as one is better than the other when God loves all of us. Amen. And so here he is. He's like, look, this, this is a situation where one brother expected to be preferred above the other. Well, God, well, God did in, the, in this example, this younger brother, you know, he was preferred because he turned around. He repented. He made a lifestyle change made a lifestyle change and because of the lifestyle change that he made God never stopped loving him his father never stopped loving him but his father opened up his eyes he didn't say that his father stood at the gate and was like is that him and he started running at him asking why he did this and why he did that and why he hadn't been here why did he waste his money on those women why he didn't go through all that the Bible says he saw him from afar and started preparing stuff he saw him from afar and started getting things ready to bless him saw him from afar can you imagine that's what God did for us that's what God did for us. He, he saw us in those situations, and he was still preparing things for when we got ready to turn ourselves around. He still was ready, still was ready to receive us fully. And then you got believers in the kingdom talking about, I don't understand how they got blessed and how they got a job right away. I'm going to believe in God for a job for a year. And she just got saved and just got in the kingdom. I know she's been out there doing this and doing that and living this way and living that way. Why does God keep doing stuff for her? Because he loves her. Because he loves her. Because he loves him, right? And so we've got to look and understand, you know, because the Bible says love is not envious. Love is not jealous. That, that, that means it doesn't matter if you've been in the kingdom for 50 years and they've been in the kingdom for two minutes. 
God's saying, look, I love both of them. I love both of them, and I'm going to bless both of them. And I'm going to love on both of them. And my demonstration was for both of them. And so we've got to know and understand that God's love is enduring. Say enduring. Our love also needs to be enduring. If you have some kids, some children, some lovely ones that came from you, or that you have adopted, and they are in a situation where they are refusing to be loved, refusing to be loved, don't want to be loved, they, are, they think they're all hard, right? I had a couple spiritual daughters that just thought they were hard. They just, they've been, they've been grown since they were 12, they raised themselves. I'm like, I don't care. I'm like, that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean anything. God told me to take care of you. So I'm gonna take care of you. So you can talk crazy, you can act crazy, you know what I'm saying? You can act like, you know, no, I'm not your biological mom. I understand you have a biological mom and you have a biological father. But guess what? I'm on assignment. And you're a part of this assignment. And you agreed that you were a part of this assignment. And because you agreed that you're a part of this assignment, I'm going to love you even if it means I don't talk to you for two or three years, which is what happens in one of my cases. Even if I don't talk to you for two or three years because you can't understand the love that I have for you. I didn't require anything. I did nothing but love you. But because you decided that you were going to pull away and show me what you got and you learned everything you need to learn, and like Bishop and I had, had taught everything that you need to learn for your life, so you got to pull away and prove stuff, then God says, look, no, no, no. I don't care. When she's ready, welcome her back. When he's ready, welcome him back. And so we had our arms open wide. When they, were, when they made that phone call after three or four years, hey, I love you. I know you've been hard-headed. I know you've been doing what you want to do. I know you've been, you know, out there or whatever, but we love you anyway. Because it's the love that, that never, ever fails. It's the love that's going to cause them to see God differently. To see God differently. If I was like, dang, look, you never call me. I haven't talked to you in three or four years. I've moved halfway around the country. I've lived over here and over here and over here. You don't even know where I live. My kids are grown now. You don't even know my kids anymore. I haven't even talked to you, blah, blah, blah. If I'd gone off like that, what, what would that have caused her to believe about her father God? And so, like, you know, we gotta, we got to stop mouthing off at people when they're in a situation where we may not understand where they are emotionally or mentally. But we've got to know and understand that all God requires us to do is not question them but love them. So I determined, hey, you know what? we got to love. Just like this prodigal son, his father, he loved, we got to love. Amen? How many of y'all know some people you need to re-love? <laughs> you got to re-love. <laughs> Anybody need to re-love somebody? It doesn't mean you stop loving them, but you know you got to refresh that thing, right? Yeah, right. You have to refresh it. Yeah. Got to refresh it. Amen. Amen. Then the next one is, and I'm going to give you this one, is evasive love. Evasive love. Abandoning the practice of fake love. That's what that's what it is. We're going to abandon the practice of fake love. Fake love. And I don't believe, <laughs> amen, uh, that we have any issues here, but fake love consists of the reverse or the opposite of what 1 Corinthians 13 love is. All right? So evasive fake love is in, it's impatient, it's unkind, it's jealous. It wants what other people have for themselves. It wants other people's stuff. It's boastful and it brags. It struts around. It's arrogant and rude. It's self-centered. Uh, it protects itself only. Um, it doesn't uh, believe or hope. It abandons and neglects, right? It's the story of Cain. Cain had fake love. Yeah, he had a brother. He didn't love his brother. Here he is. God's is asking for a, um, for a seed, asking for um, an offering. And Cain's like, look, um, I have one. And I, I'll give you what I have. Whereas his brother's like, I'm going to give you the best that I have. And the Bible says that Cain was not preferred like his brother was preferred. And so the Bible says Cain got so upset, he got angry, he got jealous. All of this stuff bubbled up on the inside of him, and he committed murder. And so here he is, he's committed murder. He committed murder because he didn't love his brother. Instead, he, he didn't have the love that God had toward him. Instead, he saw, he had a pity party and saw what he didn't have and what I did my best. You know how people think they did their best? And they, they just get in your face and they try to prove that they did their best. I did my best. No, you didn't. God said you didn't do your best because you could have gone further. You could have even looked at your brother as an example. If you weren't certain, you could have looked at your brother as an example, but instead you wanted what he had. You got mad at him because he did what I told him to do. And the Bible says that he became, you know, he was a murderer. But let me tell you how good God is. At the end of the story, God says that he says, Cain says to God, look, God, you know what? I'm going to die. People are going to kill me because I committed the first murder. I did all these things. And God said, you know what? I'm going to mark you, and I'm going to mark you so that nobody can kill you. I'm going to put a mark on you so that as, as you know, creation continues to increase and they hear the story that you killed your brother, no one will be able to lay a hand on you. And so God marked Cain. 
the first murderer to prevent somebody else from coming after and retaliating against him because even though he was in the midst of being in an unloving situation, God still loved him anyway. He hadn't even sent Jesus yet. So we got to know and understand that God's love is so important for us to understand and to get. He, if he didn't understand it before, he understood it after because God saved his life. God spared his life. And so we've got to know and understand that God, God's love for us is never family, never ending. Amen? Never, never ending. Entrusted love. Entrusted love. Number five, understanding the investment of God's preference and elevation and promotion of love. First John 4.15 says, whoever confesses and acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God and abides in him and he in God, it says, we have come to know by personal observation and experience and have believed with deep, consistent faith the love which God has for us. God is love. And the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him continually. We have to understand that God's love has been entrusted into us. And so again, moving forward, you know, as we think about um, the responsibility of love that we have, I believe that this morning, amen, that, that there are some of us in here who can take the, the, the level of love you have, and you can, I'm going to use the term, it's not a real word, right, re-love some people, right? Re-love some people. But you've got to first, you've got to first love yourself got to first love yourself. So right now, I want us to stand to our feet. You can go ahead and play. I want to stand to our feet because I really need you to get yourself in a position where you can pinpoint, pinpoint one or two things. You got to go there today. You got to go there today. Pinpoint one or two things that you need to forgive yourself from, for. What do you need to forgive yourself for? Do you go off at the mouth all the time? Do you have a foul mouth? Do you, you know, you curse people out in a minute? Do you give people, you know, peace of your mind? What are two things that you need to forgive yourself for? I want you to locate those things right now. Two things you need to forgive yourself for, right? You look down on yourself. Maybe you think other people can see what you, what you look down on yourself for, even though no one knows. But two things you need to forgive yourself for, right? And now I want you to just take that to God. Take it to him. Just say, Lord, you know what? I need you to... I need, I need to forgive myself for this. Help me to forgive myself this morning. Just ask me, help me, just it's an individual time with God. Help me to forgive myself this morning. Lord God, I've done some things in my past. I know that I asked for forgiveness then. I ask you for forgiveness, but I have not forgiven myself. And so right now, I believe it's time for you to say, you know what, I forgive me. Somebody say, I forgive me. I'll say it again, I forgive myself. Just really let that sink in yourself this morning. Whatever it is, just quietly to God. Lord, I forgive myself for it. No one has to hear what it is. Just quietly. I forgive myself for it. You've got to let go of that thing so that you can love God more effectively and you can love other people more effectively. Once you let go of that thing, we're going to pray. Amen. And we're going to pray a prayer Amen. Um, whereby now we'll be able to really at another level, embrace the love of God, but really be able to, from the overflow, re-love some people again, re-love in some situations, realizing and knowing that it's required of us. It's a commandment. It's a responsibility. Just repeat after me. Say, Father, in Jesus' name, I forgive myself of things that I've done in the past. I receive your love I embrace your love. And I ask you now, Lord, that as I move forward, that you would help me in my love walk with other people. Help me to re-love some people again. Anoint the words of my mouth. Anoint the meditations of my heart. That my mind would line up. My mouth would line up. And my actions would line up with your word. I choose to love and to love again because you first loved me. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, everybody's eyes are closed and your head is bowed. I'm going to give you an opportunity today. You heard the word of God and the Lord God has touched your heart. And you've not received Jesus as your Lord and Savior or you want to rededicate your life to the Lord. Right now is the time. Some of you heard me in here today, and I, I know the reason the Lord had me to continue to expound uh, on my own personal experience, even in learning.
just that one thing of math, because somebody needed that this morning. There might be someone in here this morning that says, hey, you know what, I realize that I get stuck in a lot of areas. And it could be because of this or that and the other, but I'm believing, Lord God, that you're going to restore what the enemy has tried to steal from me, even though I wasn't even, you know, there in, in the midst of what was going on, even though I had nothing to do with it. Lord, I believe you're going to restore for me. The first step in that is allowing Jesus to come into your heart. The first step in that is, is connecting with him so that he can be your Lord and Savior. This is what he died for. This is what he was raised for so that you can live an abundant life, so that the blood of Jesus could wash, wash the consciousness from evil things, from bad things, from simple things, from sin and, and shame and guilt and fear and all those different things, but also so that you can move forward and be abundant in your living, in your mindset, in your thinking. It can only happen with him. And so right now, again, while every believer is praying, if that's you, never receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you desire to, or rededicate your life to the Lord today, I just want you to raise your hand wherever you are so I can recognize you. You don't have to come forward or anything like that. Amen. I see your hand. Is there anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? You say, you know what, Dr. C, I, I want to give my life to the Lord today, or I want to rededicate my life today. Again, I'll give you one more opportunity. If you've already raised your hand, you don't need to raise it again. But if there's anybody else, I want you to raise your hand now. The Bible says, when you hear the Lord speaking to you, don't harden your heart. If you believe he's telling you to raise your hand, raise your hand, because he wants to do something incredible in your life today. Amen? So again, if that's you, just raise your hand. If you raised it, you don't need to raise it again. If you raised it once, is there anybody else? Amen. Well, let's pray this prayer of salvation and rededication. And I thank God and praise God for you. You're the one that raised your hand today. I know that God, has, he sees you, he understands you, he loves you. And most of all, he's getting ready to transform your life in this prayer. Amen. So let's pray together as a whole. Just say, Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for your son, Jesus, who died on the cross for my sins. I thank you, Lord, that you raised him up in power so that I could live the abundant life. Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Lord and my Savior. From this day forward, I belong to you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Give God a great big hand clap of praise. Amen. Amen. And one last prayer. I want to pray for those of you who may have been in a situation where you say, hey, you know what, that's me. I'm like still getting stuck on stuff. You know, you might be in your mind thinking, hey, I'm still getting stuck on stuff. I'm going to tell you, I prayed a prayer and I asked the Lord, like I told you back in college, and I was like, Lord, I, I, I was trying to figure out what, you know, why it clicked all of a sudden and, and why it was difficult for me in those times. Some of you might be stuck in some areas and realize that, hey, it could have been because of the habits of my, my parents or the habits of my family members that I didn't really have a lot to do with, but you believe God to break through that because uh, the Holy Spirit um, is, is not only present, but the Holy Spirit is willing and obedient to the voice of God. And the voice of God is already clear. He's made it clear that he's Jehovah Rapha, God our healer. He's made it very clear that he came here to heal us of every sickness, every disease, every disorder. And so I believe that if you have faith enough to believe, God will set things aright, set things in order, bring clarity where there needs to bring clarity, open up channels where the channels need to be opened up, and he will increase the capacity for you to learn what you need to learn and to be able to retain what you need to learn. I believe that with all my heart. I know I prayed it for people before, I prayed it for myself, and I know that God has done it and will do it. I used to have issues even um, memorizing things. I can look at something now and almost memorize it the first time I see it. That was not always that way. I know that it's because of the grace of God on my life. I know it's because of the anointing of the Lord on my life. And that God is not a respecter of persons. In principle, what he does for one, he'll do for another. Amen? Amen. So those of you who say, you know what, Pastor C, you know what, I, I, I feel stuck in some areas. And I'm believing God because of some things that maybe my family members have done. I want to be unstuck if that's you raise your hand. Amen? Amen. So let's pray this prayer together. Just say, Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you. For your, power, for your power to heal, to, heal, to, deliver, to deliver, and to set free. And set free. Lord, I ask right now, Lord, right now that you would bring clarity, that you would bring clarity where there needs to be clarity in my mind, in my, mind, in my, body, in my body, in my spirit. In my spirit. Lord, I Lord, I thank you for setting an order, setting an order and, realigning and realigning 
so that I can move forward and be abundant in you. Lord, I'm asking that you'd increase my capacity to retain information, that you'd increase my ability to learn information, and that you would cause me to assimilate information in a way that I never have before. Lord, I thank you that you are taking me intellectually and in my mind from glory to glory. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Hallelujah. Well, I thank God and praise God for you all today.